today we will continue to understand what we mean by language disorder and in particular that is in the domain of language disorder certain types of difficulties in learning. Dyslexia and dysgraphia are such two difficulties that are often pointed out. We want to look at these two from a developmental perspective that is, is are these really disorder or are they developmental phenomena. In particular, we are going to be looking at how these two are part of developmental phenomena and not so much part of disorder. What looks apparently the type of difficulty is really a stage in developmental phenomena in the process of learning of language. We have looked at language teaching and what goes in language teaching in terms of its theoretical background and methods of language teaching in particular context of second language acquisition. Keeping all these three things and associated topics in mind, we are going to be looking at this particular aspect of language disorder as developmental phenomena from experimental perspective. A closer understanding of dyslexia and dysgraphia shows that there is a pattern in what gets reflected as dyslexia with lots of data and account we have invited Professor Sirish Chaudhary to be talking about these two aspects of what is known as in particular disorder. However, we are going to be presenting this in order for us to understand the relevance of these two in understanding developmental phenomena of language as in applied linguistics. And this is the pattern that is going to be relevant, the developmental development of patterns and our findings of pattern in understanding these things which are generally known as disorder is what helps us understand applied linguistics issues, what follows from a detailed study of language in a scientific order. Please look at these two things from developmental perspective. What we are going to be also looking at in the topics that Professor Chaudhary is going to be covering in this discussion are a relationship between mind, brain and body, how dyslexia is related to errors in reading and dysgraphia is related to errors in writing, the differences between hearing and listening and language learning in particular which is going to show finally that dyslexia and dysgraphia are potentially the two stages in learning to read and write. Language disorders have always been there ever since there has been mankind. Christ was crucified because of preaching something. Some of Christ's followers were crucified because they lisped. The history of you know, Bible translation says that the Pharaoh was particularly unhappy when somebody pronounced sh as in English in place of s as in this. Everybody in Bengal would have perished <laughs> under Pharaoh and only people from Bihar would have survived. So Pritha and I would be safe because both of us come from Bihar. But similarities end. I wish Rajesh had scheduled me before Pritha. After her range of documentation and generalization, I am afraid I might disappoint you with the limited data and tall claims that I am going to make. 
But anyway, you know, since sciences have grown more through blunders than through concerted, coherent efforts, I take courage to share whatever disturbing thoughts I have. Let's talk about dyslexia. Very briefly, reading errors are known as dyslexia, writing errors are known as dysgraphia, but it has lots of other sub-varieties. Are the two unrelated? We do not know enough. They don't seem to be unrelated. Let's move on. Next, please. Lots of people who were known to have been dyslexics in their early childhood. If you Google celebrities with you know, uh, dyslexia, the first page alone gives you more than 250 names of celebrities who come from nearly all fields of human activity, from philosophy to politics, from most intellectual to most mundane. Some names that I thought you might want to see are those of Agatha Christie, Woodrow Wilson, President, perhaps somebody said Woodrow Wilson has been the brainiest president of the US of A, Albert Einstein, Winston Churchill, and who not. The, the, the huge question concerning all of us doing anything with human beings is the question of our understanding of brain. Actually, nobody other than Dr. Virudhigiri Nathan should be here <laughs> because he is the only person who has made a lifetime study of brain. Even today, I am sure, and yet, Dr. Virudhigiri Nathan would agree, Professor Virudhigiri Nathan would agree with me that we do not know enough about brains. We know something about its anatomy. We know something about its physiology. We also know a lot about its biochemistry. But we know little. You know, Chomsky says, we know as much about brain today as we knew about physics in the days of Galileo, which is nearly nothing. There are different traditions, you know, and we don't have, this is not the place to go into that. But please grant me <coughs> the understanding that we have limited understanding of brain. Next screen, please. For those of us interested in reading about brains, and it continues to be a topic of great interest across fields, lots of books, papers, articles, popular and uh, newspaper articles are written, uh, popular and academic articles are written frequently, but two books that would interest and that may be understood by all of us of recent origin are the following. Uh, this gentleman, Dr. Chalavi, is a neurosurgeon and is a neurosurgeon of Egyptian origin working in the UK. He and his colleagues have done a beginner's guide on the brain. Any one of us interested in understanding how brain is structured and functions should look at this book. It costs but an eminently readable book. And then of course, a still better book in my opinion, cheaper and more eminently readable is the one by Swami Satprakashanandiji. Uh, published by Ram Krishnan Mutt, Mind According to Vedanta. We have a different tradition of understanding mind. We think mind has four levels. Consciousness has four levels. We distinguish between mind and brain. We distinguish between mind and body. Uh, in the Western tradition of sciences, it's not yet clear what is mind, what is brain, where brain ends and body begins, except anatomically, perhaps. Some of these questions can be for those of us who are interested, who are students and curious, uh, please. And both of them have no algorithms, no formula which is difficult to understand, written with lots of anecdotes and case examples, case studies, and they are eminently enjoyable. Uh, please. A similar thing with input to the brain. You know, input to the brain is through many channels, visual, tactile, but a substantial amount of it comes through our ears. But how much do we know about ears? We know a lot about the anatomy of ears. We know a lot about its physiology. We know that this is how ears are structured. We know how, why our two ears are not exactly symmetrical and why we have two ears, why it is cartilage, why it is not bone, how sound signals reach cochlea, 
how cochlea makes different kinds of angles under pressure from different kinds of sonic booms, sonic signals, but then we have to stop there. We do not know, we do not know what happens beyond. We do not know how these signals are converted into individual sounds. Why somebody called Devki can be misunderstood as, misunderstood as Janaki or somebody called Janaki can be misunderstood as Devki. You know, there are correlations, yet there are not. And brain makes these finer distinctions. And unless we make these distinctions, we do not understand and speak language correctly. It, 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 is, it is crucial to us. And somebody called human being understands these things. The brain works with these things absolutely fabulously without any instruction from any one of us. In other words, what we are talking about is God's world of which we have very limited understanding. We know little about brains because functioning human brain is not available for study. We either, whatever we know about brains, we know either through dead brains or through brains which are not at the best of their health. There are other kinds of difficulties. I am very confident Professor Virudu Giranathan can say much more, more authentically about them. All I am trying to say is that language is related to brain and we know little about brain. Actually, you know, as I go on further, I will ask you to join me in challenging many other assumptions we have cherished as God-given. We believe that languages can be learned so long as there is exposure and there is motivation. Not necessarily. Not necessarily true. Everybody in India wants to have English. There is plenty of exposure of English to Indians in India, you know, or to any other language. In that case, all siblings will become Ravindranath Tagore or there will be no Ravindranath Tagore, you know. The amount of exposure, motivation for use does not significantly differ. There are many unanswered questions in the field. See, why fewer adults are successful language learners than children? We do not know. And please don't tell me there is age barrier because there are any number of adults who learn a good number of foreign languages past puberty, past adulthood, some even when they become old. You know, uh, Pritha mentioned Bengalis and Pritha mentioned non-Hindi speakers. The best work on the collection of Ramayanas was written by a Belgian priest, somebody called Father Kamil Bulke, working in Jharkhand. He read 400 Ramayanas and wrote a comprehensive book called Ram Katha in Hindi. And he spoke, if there can be some word called chaste Hindi, because chaste Hindi is a contradiction in terms. Hindi is a pigeon, you know. But he, he wrote that. So, you know, lots of adults learn, and lots of adults don't. Why does it happen? Why do we not, all of us have mastered at least our initial languages well, but why not later languages equally well? Why does IIT Madras have at least 400 faculty members who have lived all their life here, but they don't speak Tamil, at least not acceptably? You know, there, there, there is absolutely no reason. And, you know, there are always our children, faculty children in Kendri Vidyalaya who pick up Tamil in no time, both taboo words and good words. Okay. Why children learn pronunciation more thoroughly than it? And there are any number of questions. These are not the three. I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that we, know we have absolutely limited and at the best you know, speculative knowledge about language and language learning. Okay. These milestones, you know, you can Google, you can reach, you, know, you, you can click this website and you get lots of data. These are, however, generally attested that at certain age, a child would have certain kind of language proficiency. You know, once again, why does it happen worldwide? So we cannot say there is nothing like universal grammar. We can only say that language is a God's gift to mankind. It's not an invention. It's an attribute. Like God gave flying to, you know, to quote Chomsky again, as Pritha did. It's like, you know, God created, like God created fish to swim, birds to fly. He perhaps created man to speak. And that is why Greek philosophers called human beings homo loquens, talking animals. Next, another irrefutable fact 
seems to be the case that all children learn language or languages untutored, we might deceive ourselves by saying that, you know, our children speak better language because we have taught them. There is, however, you know, nothing to bear this fact. Yes, exposure is important. Yes, motivation is important. But there is something more. I won't even get into the debate between language learning or language acquisition. These are play on words. You, you, you don't learn, you don't acquire anything without active effort. Whether we understand that activity or activeness well is another matter. If you look at how brain develops, and I have taken these diagrams from a journal of neuroscience from the University of Columbia, it's slightly dated. This, the, you know, I took it from an article which appeared in the 60s. I can give you reference if you like. But the, you know, the first picture, the neural network in the first brain is of the child at birth. But see how with exposure it develops at six months and at two years. And imagine, you know, how it goes. Uh, uh, that, you know, and Professor Bridu Giridanathan knows, knew him and I knew him. There used to be somebody here called a very famous neurosurgeon called Dr. Ramamurthy. And a very active person, but very humble as most learned people in Chennai are. You know, he's, he, he, he was very fond of saying, that we know little about brains. And one of his, these fond sayings was that an old man's brain may contain fewer neurons, but they are all connected. So that an old man can see more connections between things otherwise disparate. A child, on the other hand, may have many more neurons in good health, good shape, but they all may not be as intricately connected as an old man's brain. As a result, the child may not see connections between different things. But once again, you know, the point is we do not know enough. Let's try, let's explore, let's learn. Does language learning be begin before birth? If it is a developmental phenomenon, then you know, like the growth of the fetus, like the growth of the human being, you know, like the growth of a seed into the banyan tree, it should have begun somewhere there. There are, you know, there isn't enough evidence, there is not plentiful evidence, but there is evidence that, you know, language learning begins, you know, within weeks of pregnancy, within weeks of our taking shape in life inside our mother's wombs. If you are interested, there are plenty of, plenty of studies on that, but no matter how many, it's not enough. Children have been found to recognize tunes they heard you know, favorite television serials of their mothers, when those tunes were played, the children somehow seemed to recognize those tunes from those that they hadn't heard before. There are some experimental evidences of that we do not know. Nobody has the answer, including Chomsky. Look at some, you know, how children learn, analogies. We seem to learn from analogies. A child and a grandfather talking, the f grandfather says to the child, less than four. We are now cross less than three, actually. We are now crossing Tinagar. We will soon be in Chetpet. Do you understand? The conversation takes place in Maithili. Uh, actually, it, is, uh, it was me and my grandson. Incidentally, my grandson is much older now, <coughs> as I am, of course. You know? And the grandchild says, yes, grandfather, I knew. But as you have Tinagar, does this place also have a chocolate nagar? You know, I mean, his obvious connection is, you know, tea, chocolate, biscuit, toffee, coffee, you know, they go together. Not that Tinagar can be the, the name of a locality followed by a chet pet, etc., etc., etc. The human faculty to recognize classes, categories, subcategories are, is at work from early infancy. Do children learn what they hear? Yes. And they learn more, you know. They also learn taboo words. They learn curse words. All of us know how to tell lies. And nobody has been, nobody has got any tuition in telling lies. None of our parents sat down and told us, today I'll teach you how to tell lies. And lies are wonderful things. Lies are the only thing that distinguishes us from other animals. Otherwise, you know, we would not be writing books where a cloud would be told, cloud, cloud, 
please go to my beloved and tell her I am unhappy away from her. That's a lie. Cloud cannot go to Alkapuri and tell the, you know, Cloud's beloved that the Cloud is unhappy. You know, entire thing that we call art, quote unquote, is something which has never happened. You know, and language and human mind have the faculty to go beyond, you know, what they hear, beyond experience. Experience perhaps, you know, I am saying perhaps because we do not know enough, again, is essential. And in all languages, none of us sits down and tells our child, today I am going to give you a tuition in taboo words or in, you know, socially unacceptable words. For those of us who are interested in this area, there is a wonderful book by Jaws Lakoff when generative semantics was in fashion. My generation of students in linguistics uh, uh, was asked to do, you know, a term paper on, uh, on Lakoff's book. It was called F dash dash C K I N G linguistics. <laughs> and he has classified, yeah, and he has classified that all abuses in all languages of the world can only be of three kinds. They either wish you death or distortion or they insult your female relatives. You know, here is another gender bias example. But the point here is, the great point here is, uh, I, I may not say all of us, because there are civilized people also here, but many of us know these bad words. And without tutoring, nobody has sat down and, you know, and children also learn social stuff. Before a child is five, the child learns whether a particular word should be used publicly or only among friends or not even among friends, not even in the family. Who tells them? Who sits down? Who, 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 you know? So what we are talking about is a very powerful machine, you know, which, which takes care of giving the data, which not only reprograms, re-reprograms itself, but also reaches correct generalizations. For multilingual children, who tells them to speak to this person in language X and that person in language Y? And there are plenty of data from multilingual communities. If you, you know, there have been studies of Swiss children. Unfortunately, this is one area where we lag. India being the most multilingual country or among the most multilingual country, we don't even today have a good corpus of, you know, multilingual children's utterances. Maybe young linguists can think of doing some projects in this area. But from whatever little is available, you could see that, you know, children switch between languages, regardless of etymology, at their will, and to be being socially correctly. Say, for example, here, somebody asks the child, how does your father go to office? How does your father travel to the office, commute to the office? And the child says, sometimes on a bike, sometimes on a car, but the child lisps. So it does not say bike, say bike. Tabi tabi bite se, tabi tabi tal se. You know, it is systematic. It comes, if you make mistake with ka, you also make mistake with kha, ga, dha, da. Okay? And using words of one language into another. That's what I meant by etymology. It is not that tumare papa kaise daftar jate hai. Kabi kabi dupahiya gari se, kabi kabi charpahiya gari se. You know, whatever you hear, etymology won't matter. Or, for example, look at the other interesting example, you know. Somebody asks a young child, you know, multilingual in Bengali, Maithili, Hindi, English, and Telugu. And the child is asked, how did you travel? And the child says, I was told to climb the bus. Now, climb the bus, ut is climb in Bangla. Am I right? You know, uto, uto, uh, charo, charo, you know. But the inflection here comes from Maithili. So, you know, the children know what is stem, what is inflection, and they don't care where they take, from where they take what. Similarly, you know, switch between languages. They may be instructed in only one language, but they might speak in another. The grandmother says, go and tell your brother why he is not eating. And the instruction is given in Maithili. But the child says in Bangla, the child talks to her brother in Bangla, say, why do you not eat the Why do you not eat the meal you have been given? The grandmother has not told the child, go and tell your brother in Bengali. The grandmother has given the instruction in Maithili, but the child switches. How do the children know? Nobody has sat down and told them. Similarly, look at 
another, you know, the same child again, uh, come down, the grandmother says, Richa uh, Bimla aunty ke bajao, Richa go and call Bimla aunty, you know, the housemaid. And Richa knows that Bimla aunty speaks only Hindi. So Richa aunt tells Bimla aunty, Bimla aunty aapko bhavi, bhavi bula rahi hai. You know, these are, I mean, if you are interested, uh, the, some of these things are there in uh, Indian linguistics. I can give you references to those papers. You can find plenty of data. The point I'm trying to make is that language grows on you with age, years, and experience, and in many facets, not only in its grammatical, but also what we call sociolinguistic, though I am yet to, I, I, I'm not sure where grammatical ends and sociolinguistic begins. Same, more of the same, please. Go next, take next. Okay, now I'm going to present some data on from children who are supposedly dyslexic and trying to get you to see if, they are, if, if it is really a disorder or it's a developmental problem. For those of you who understand Devanagari, who can write Devanagari or Hindi, this is an example of an error. It should go from right to left, not from left to right. Okay? Kale Hiran ki kya thi? What were the distinguishing features of black buck? Okay? But the child has done it from left. See here, the teacher has, 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 has marked, okay? Similar things, you know, all over. If we had time, I could have gone into some detail in some of these things, but it should be uski aankhein lal thin, aankhein istriling hai. You know, there is again, as Pritha rightly said, no, we do not know why eyes are feminine and ears are masculine, maybe because ears take a lot of shock and eyes don't, you know. There can be explanations, right? But some of those errors, I will soon tell you what is the typology of these errors. Please go to the next screen. No, the child should give one kind of opposite, the child gives another kind of opposite. The child should have one kind of nasal, but the child gives another. The child should have one kind of nasal, but the child gives another kind of nasal. But nasal still, okay? And this is about a seven or eight year old child. I'm sorry, under 10. I'm not exactly sure. Similar errors elsewhere. Next. Okay? The child has, child seems to have been asked to copy it. You know, excellent essay. You know, many, some adults can be difficult to live with. Yes, you know, this is looking at the adult's world from a child's point of view. Some adults can be difficult to live with, okay? And you may long for the day you will be over and the child forgot the word. And the teacher will mark that child down for bad English. Is it bad English? You know, the kind of syntax that is there in the first sentence itself is, you know, a passive embedded and made into a simple. You know, it's, it's the as complex a sentence syntactically. If you do the trees, you will have to do two sentences, collapse them into one, then get them. You know, the child shows a, some kind of an extraordinary mastery of language, but at the performance level, or if I may use Prithas term at the E level, the child seems to have forgot to put in another word. You will be over age to leave home and find etc, 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 etc. The child makes a simple mistake, you know, order. So, you know, the mistake of geometry, going from right to left or left to right, and then order. And in a language like English, that can be very significant. Whether you have EI or IE, many English teachers make a living out of that. You know, if you, if you wrote receive as IE, then you are wrong. It should be EI, R-E-C-E-I, V-E. -E. But in substance, how much of English spelling should a child learn? Did, was English spelling always like that? Until about Dr. Johnson's dictionary, 1754, you could, wrote, you could write both ways. Look at Shakespeare's script, look at manuscripts of the 17th, 16th century. So a lot of, polit a lot of pronunciation and spelling are politics. But look at the child's plight. The child otherwise has a good language, but because the child 
makes mistakes with order or geometry, the child is dubbed. This child was dubbed dyslexic. And there are plenty of, you know, other examples elsewhere. Please move on. Look at the spelling of deceive, etc., etc., and a few other words. All, you know, that similar, mistakes of similar kind. Similarly here, you know, Hindi, I, for those of us who are from IIT Madras, perhaps you might remember somebody called Professor Kalyan Krishnan of Computer Science and Engineering Department. Kalyan Krishnan at one point of time looked at the writing systems of all major Indian scripts, including Hindi and Telugu. And he came to the conclusion that Telugu was one of the most difficult languages to, uh, difficult scripts to learn and write in the world. To learn, to write Telugu, you need to learn 486 di discrete, you know, combinations, symbol combinations, followed by Malayalam, followed by Devanagari. And English was the easiest. English does not have half letters. English does not have crowns and shoes, whereas Telugu has half letter, full letter, quarter letter, you know, <laughs> crowns and shoes, etc., etc. So it is one of those crowns and shoes. Kalyan Krishna used to say that for R alone, and, and look at the, look at the, look, uh, you know, look at the comedy in it. Hindi speakers, so-called Hindi speakers, because Hindi, I don't know who is Hindi speaker. So-called Hindi speakers feel immensely proud. Ours is a very scientific script. They will tell you at every other stop, you know. You start from Sedapet to Paris, every other stop they will remind you, Hindi, Hindi, you know. Uh, you write, you need six different kinds of symbols to write one poor, simple Ra. Look at the two Ra's here, one and the two, okay. The mistake that the child has made is this, should not have come here. This should have come here. Okay. Is that such a serious mistake as to dub that, as to label that child a dyslexic and send her to a special coaching, a special tuition, create, you know, cause, you know, mental agony to the parents, putting them to expenses and sleepless nights? There are any number of other examples. Please go on. Look at bhakti, you know. The only mistake that the child has made it, it should have been a little less long, the, that the trunk of the elephant should not have touched the letter over there. You know, all, all graphics or graphology, you know, I'll, I'll tell you in, in, in a later slide, have only two shapes. They are either variations of lines or they are variations of circles. And when we learn a new script, all of us, it has been demonstrated that adults are worse learners of new scripts than children. But nobody calls an adult a dyslexic because you can afford to get away with mistakes. Please go on. Next. Similar thing. You know, look at the, the poor child. But she has written a Telugu song as part of her dictation in this school. It's only that this horn, this saxophone should have been on the first letter not on the second. It has become Telugu, whereas it should have been Telugu. You know, I'm reminded of a German colleague who in spite of four years in IIT Madras kept calling Devki as Devaki <laughs> because he was misled by Roman. So, you know, these things happen with all of us, adults or children. Uh, another child, other sets of mistakes, you know, similar. You know, all those reds, if you look at them, they all point to the same thing. Mistakes of a few finite kind, okay? I just put on some things here, you know, you own it to them. It should have been, you owe it to them. What time will you be back? When will you be back? In your part of country, you know, just poor without that intrusive you in the second syllable and the penultimate syllable, the word is all right. Country, an uproar among students. There was a boy, what harm is there if bees capital there? Now Google has done, you know, the one great favor Google has done to the English language is, you know, after Noah Webster, is to have done away with the redundancy of block capitals and lowercase letters. You write Virudhigiri Nathan, either way you will get Professor Virudhigiri Nathan. You know, even if you miss a few vowels, okay. So his mother name was, his mother's name was, after some months he got thought painting, he got through painting, you know. 
is that, uh, that T is an unwanted addition that the child needs. I have taken, collected these examples from the scripts whose photos I presented uh, a while ago. After some months, he got the painting. Father didn't know what to do. A K and a W would make it right. But the child is, you know, at that particular moment, you know, and many British do that. Many British don't dist dist distinguish between, while writing, between IT apostrophe and S, and ITS without apostrophe. But we don't call them dyslexic. The necklace in the bank starts where twinkling, not where twinkling. If you look at these mistakes carefully, you will find they are either mistakes because of intrusion or omission, not because of biological deficiency. So if we look at all errors of spelling, they are only of three kinds. Either they are errors related to geometry or shape of letters, you know, something should, a circle should be right looking with a stroke, then it is D, a circle left looking with a stroke, then it is B. You know, a many child can, many children can write book, duke for book, book for duke, you know, because of this kind of confusion. Or related to order of letters, E, I or I, E, okay? Or related to iteration, you should have two E's, two I's, two A's, etc., etc. There is no fourth kind of mistake. With age, with time, you know, it has been found that all those celebrities I named became great writers. Agatha Christie sold more novels. Now with Harry Potter, we cannot say she, she sold more, but until Harry Potter came, that also goes to show that women are better storytellers. You know? they, they, they tell more stories and make more money out of them than you know, uh, men. Agatha Christie had the record, now Harry Potter, whatever God bless her name, you know, has made more money. Uh, Winston Churchill got Nobel Prize for Literature, writing history, you know. So, you know, volumes. And if you haven't read his book or the history of English-speaking peoples or history of the First World War, then you haven't read something best, something wonderful in the English language. You know, you should. All of these people turned to become great writers. Actually, one of the assumptions in the field of dyslexia I study is that most of these children are gifted children. They're hyperactive. They need to sit down quietly, give in support and comfort, and then with time, they, you know, if you draw their attention to these differences, differences of the geometry, differences of order and iteration, they, they, they you know, uh, do get all right. They, they get back to, quote, unquote, normal. Uh, uh, you know, this is a child's, uh, you know, uh, linear study, uh, as we will call it in uh, statistics and, and language studies. The child when she was seven, the child when she was nine, the child when she was 11. Today the child is a manager in a big international firm working in Chennai. She also went out to a study at Edinburgh, etc., and got a master's degree in uh, economic sciences. But this is a three-year slice. The child used to make, you know, mistakes of 62% mistakes of all spelling errors were from related to geometry. More in Hindi, less in English. Because, you know, Hindi geometry is much more complex. You have more combinations of circles, dashes, lines, broken lines, horns and shoes than English has. So naturally, she has made more, you know, 62% against 25%. At the age of nine, her mistakes of geometry almost disappeared, both in Hindi and English. More exposure, some patience on the part of the teacher and the parents and other relatives the child is, as is, is almost, you know, writes error-free language on that score. Go to the next. Related to order, whether E comes before I or I comes before E. You know, Hindi has fewer problems of that kind because Hindi has more symbols, whereas English makes do with only 26 letters and 26 into 2 if you take lowercase and uppercase. Hindi has any number of, you know, Hindi has 39 or Hindi has 42 letters, then so many diacritics, as Kalyan Krishnan said, 482 combinations to be able to read, write, read and write Hindi. So naturally, greater mistakes in Hindi, you know, related to order. Sorry, uh, Hindi she has got in the order, the mistakes of order are not there in Hindi because Hindi has more symbols, but because English uses the same symbols 
time and again in combination with different letters and their value changes. E after C is S, E after G is G, etc., etc. Okay, so you have get and you know <coughs> other kinds of words. Look at the d graph at 7, at 9, at 11, you know, fewer mistakes as the child grows. Related to iteration, very few in Hindi, because Hindi again has more symbols, more in English, at 9, at 11, the child is yet to overcome all of them. The point I'm making, and I will stop here, is that we don't have enough evidence. We haven't done, you know, studies of the kind that we ought to, you know, in India, we are an overcrowded country. We don't have enough money. We are an emerging country. Our political and educational policies and priorities are not always in line with what many developed countries think they ought to be. So we haven't had, you know, we, we, we don't have enough data to conclude one way or either. But if you think carefully and if you look at whatever data are available, then you find that most language disorders are not disorders at all. They are developmental problems which children can be helped to overcome with some patience, some time, and some support. Thank you very much. I would doubt very much that people who are currently assessing children with uh, disabilities would, would look at these as specific instances of dyslexia. I also think that uh, I would disagree with you when you said that children with these so-called difficulties or disorders have uh, only the need for patience and uh, perseverance on the part of a teacher. Um, this is actually not true, especially in the case of disorders like autism, where it seems to have a fundamental, uh, the wiring of the brain seems to be different. And for them, acquiring language from exposure to it and doesn't seem to work the same way as it does for typically developing uh, children. So that, that, is, that is a comment I wanted to make. Um, the, 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 I, I do have a follow-up question as well, and I was also wondering if I could request uh, Professor Pritha to also perhaps give her uh, views on some of these things. But um, I, I was curious what you think is the impact of, for example, the existence of autism as a language disorder or the existence of dyslexia as a literacy disorder. How, how does that tie in with Chomsky's views on universal grammar? Uh, universal grammar really lives, lives and dies by the fact that there is a general purpose, you know, language acquisition device in our brains which uh, is able to acquire any language. Any human being is able to acquire any language. So obviously, there's something that breaks in, the ch in, in a ch child with autism or a child with uh, any of these other disabilities. How does uh, the current work in universal grammar reconcile um, these kinds of disabilities with the Chomskyan hypothesis of universal acquisition of language? People are looking at um, kids with autism. And by the way, autism is a wide spectrum, as you will know. So you have. Uh, this dissociation between the cognitive abilities and the linguistic abilities varying a lot. So you could have kids who um, can write and read multiple languages, which is something I would like to come back to later on. But they, d they can't do the basic cognitive tasks like sh tying shoes. Uh, but then there are kids on the other spectrum also where you know they don't know languages and they probably will be able to do other kinds of uh, activities. For instance, remembering dates or will being able to tell you the day of a particular, so if you say, 1975, 1st September, right? Something like that, and they give you the day because they have this ability to permute and go back and you know come up with a particular uh, day. It's a Wednesday or Tuesday, so it's a very very wide spectrum. I think most of the uh, experiments in neurolinguistics and psycholinguistics so far has been uh, mainly with. Uh, trying to see which part of the brain is affected, which I don't, I'm a little skeptical also probably I'm, I come from the theoretical, um, I look at things from a theoretical standpoint, um, because sometimes they are unable to explain uh, holistically how, uh, let's say someone who learns language as usual um, would, would differ from someone who can't lang learn language probably because of some of these disorders or one of the more well-defined disorders. So there, there is this problem out there. But as I said, autism itself is a very uh, difficult thing because I remember um, watching a, a documentary on YouTube and I have also has had this question in my mind for a long time. 
So there is this uh, girl who is now grown up, a very severe case of autism, I don't remember which one, but she couldn't communicate. I don't think she's a hy hyperactive kid, but um, she obviously couldn't communicate. And then they started using the computer, uh, the, you know, the uh, keyboard, right? And you, would, you also know that you have to nudge them, so they don't, you know, there is also always, it's assumed that there is a theory of mind problem, that, they, uh, that these special kids can't, uh, understand what you want, right? And then it turned out that upon like years and years of training and nudging, uh, that girl who is now a woman, she would now type out her thoughts. She can't communicate, but she's typing out her thoughts in perfect language, right? English. Uh, so it's very strange. I mean, what would this say about the language faculty? Is it there in, let's say, at least some kids with or, or you know, adults with autism? And there is a interface problem that you kn you hear, you probably understand, but somewhere you're not able to communicate. So communication is very essential for you to have that bridge. And so somewhere that could be there. Then I also know kids, and in fact one of my colleagues has a hyperactive kid, very hyperactive, and uh, he there is this app that has come out recently where you can learn a new language by choosing ma matching words. So you know uh, Hindi. I don't know. You have given words in two different languages jumbled up, and then you have to. Um, yeah, so yes, I forget the name, it's called Lingo or no? Duolingo, something like this. Yeah, something very interesting. It turns out that the kid, again, upon nudging, you know, you keep nudging the child at the elbow, has been able to match, which is strange because the, neither the parents nor the child knows German or the German script. Right? So I think there is an immense ability out there. We just have to manifest it. I don't know if Professor Chaudhary would agree, but it seems like a lot of things are there. And I, I think on one thing we agree that we really don't know a lot about many, many things, both Indians and otherwise also, right? We don't know where we are. Or maybe we also don't, we don't know about particulars. We also don't know about how to tie things up. There is a problem. And so uh, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, I think autistic kids or adults, they, they are able to do a lot more. And somewhere, even if they have the language faculties to start off with, Somewhere that interface to be able to share your thoughts and your language with others is somewhere missing, at least for some of them. My thoughts, again, very, very preliminary because I'm not a neurolinguist. And maybe my many more things in between. We don't know. We're, because see, it's a very modular, it's a very modular thing, right? So as I think I found, I found the, those slides where you're showing the synaptic connections. Right, you have this, uh, when, when you're born, you have fewer connections, synaptic connections. When you, at six months of age, the synaptic connections become more frequent, and later on you have more. So I think that is also true, even though I won't go with the connectionist view, because there's also a very strong connectionist view that says that everything comes from experience. I think part of it is also driven by what we have within ourselves. Part is internal, part is external, and I think the two are so related. But uh, Western science, to some extent, has done a huge mistake of saying that you're Object of study is completely different from the subject, right? So it's, it's, I, I think that environment is very important. And somewhere biology has gone back to that idea. So there is that thing. So you may have started off with a few modules, let's say, independent functioning units. And then how to connect them is very essential. So it is true if you look at the studies of Piaget, for instance, you will see that kids recognize independent. So one toad, and then again you, recognize, you see the same toad somewhere else. You will not be able to relate this toad to the other toad. You will say, oh, there's another toad. You will, the child will not be able to uh, you know, f find out the path from this toad to this toad, giving the same identity to it. So there, is, there are two different modalities out there, two different modules working out there. But as we grow older, maybe the synaptic connections become more, much more complex, and our ability to, to see the world as a complex whole, as a holistic uh, thing, probably becomes uh, through. Right? So my very uh, initial thoughts. Uh, um, this is regarding uh, the labeling part which you said. Uh, the whatever problems we observe, uh, actually I'm from a uh, field of uh, speech language pathology and audiology. So we label uh, children as uh, language based to learning disability. I can give you a clinical example, if a child of uh, four years, chronological age, and uh, language delay of two years, if the, as the child grows, uh, if the gap of delay keeps growing, we label the child as language based uh, learning disability, where the characteristics will uh, exhibit similar. Perhaps not all. But lots of children can be helped to overcome many of these problems by understanding the kinds of errors they make and why they make those errors. The problem is, you know, and this, this is what I wanted to say. 
we look at their errors in isolation from the rest of their performance. And I can give you any number of scripts, not just one, you know. Uh, in my own collection, I have scripts of several children over a decades, you know, long collection, where I find that children give examples of absolutely fabulous language. But if they make some mistake, you know, then the teacher, the parent, and the caregiver attend or give disproportionate attention to that little island of error than to the rest of it. That is where our problem lies. I am certainly not implying that there are no autistic children. I am certainly not saying that we understand everything and all. We don't. The importance of exposure to language, I guess we, we cannot forget uh, about feral children. So, uh, you know, like about feral children, uh, the children who are completely cut off from uh, language for like probably 11, 13 years of their lives and then, then they are introduced into this world and they are exposed to language. For example, Jeannie. So she was completely isolated. She was um, uh, kept in a room, like in a dark room for like 13 years and then when people tried to expose her to language, of course, she picked up quite a few things but probably she would never match to uh, a, a, a normal speaker who has already been exposed to language since uh, day one. So I, uh, I'm also curious that if there is any kind of study that has been done for feral children and to determine what kind of uh, deficiency or what kind of disorders do they uh, face or is, is it uh, an area which is probably unexplored yet? But whatever little language the child was eventually able to pick up went through those stages of development sounds, syllables, words, phrases, sentence, and discourse. It's only that in the case of this child, it was faster, not four years, not, you know, 200 weeks. It was fewer weeks, fewer days. But stages, milestones were the same. And even otherwise, Dr. Virudhigiri Nathan will tell you that, you know, all children do not grow at the same rate quote unquote, all normal children also do not grow at the same rate. You know, God's, in, in God's world, there is mass production, but each piece is unique. We should try and understand those types and help them, you know, help the children. That certainly doesn't mean that no child needs help, all children are quote unquote normal. No, certainly not. Some children are born differently. What will interest a child? is not very clear. Okay? But two things are very clear. Number one, that children need to hear at least some quantity of language so that they can learn. And second, as you know, Chomsky calls it Plato's problem because, you know, it's philosophizing. It's for all of us. How do you and I know somebody is telling lies? I am told that women are good at making these judgments. Please don't make that judgment about me. Okay. Uh, Thank you, sir. You know, how do we know more than we see? Okay. The best case is language. Which child has ever sat down? Which mother has ever sat down to tell the child, today, child, I'm going to teach, teach you passive voice in Bengali? Are you mightily? English, yes. Second language, yes. Foreign language, yes. And allow me to give you a wonderful example. My daughter was very fond of, you know, and I've quoted it in many seminars, that when my wife makes a mistake and the milk is spilt, then they say, hey, milk got spilt, passive voice. Are doot to jal gaya, doot to gir gaya. But my daughter used to say, jab usse hota hai, to tumne to jala diya doot. That is how children learn passive voice. When you shift the blame, or you don't want to own it, we, 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 we do not know. What we know is, we know more than we hear, more than we experience. That, that is what makes us human beings and that is what puts behaviorists in good company like, you know, quadrupeds, horses, dogs, etc., etc. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is more of personal nature. Um, I'm Shobha and um, I'm a Maharashtrian. I married a Tamilian. Wow. I have two sons and, uh, you know, it's sometimes very confusing at home. We are a joint family where my father-in-law uh, and my husband's brother, his child, they also live, we all live together. But sometimes when mother comes, my mother comes to take care of my children when I'm away, 
I find this kind of translation that happens very naturally. Say, for example, my elder son is now 10, and uh, when he speaks to me, he speaks in this Marathi English mode, and when he goes and speaks to his father, he speaks in English Tamil mode, and when he speaks to his paternal grandfather, it's a, it is only Tamil mode, and when he speaks to my mother, it is only Marathi mode. So I was very curious, and um, I kind of asked him when he was around five or six, okay, why do you do this? Then he said, I don't know, ma. I don't know why I do this, but I'm doing it. And then when he was at 10 or something, now he's in a sixth standard. Right. So I asked him, you still do this? Do you think Appa doesn't know Marathi, or do you think, uh, you know, uh, your I doesn't know uh, Tamil? No, all of them know all the languages, but I think they're very comfortable. They answer to me in that language. And that is why I, you know, talk I back in that particular language. Now my younger son, who's five years old, he again does this. So I asked him, why do you do this? I want to see whether all children do it in the same manner or whether there's going to be a difference in their perceptions of language. So when I asked him, he said, um, um, no, Ma, just like that. I don't know. You speak to me like that, so I speak to you like that. So I thought it was a mirror kind of an effect. And later I also learned that my elder son, at a very later level, he told me that, uh, Ma, you know what I says? She says, speak in Marathi. And you know what my tata says, his paternal grandfather? Ni Tamil dam pesano. So, you know, and in their birth certificate, my husband has put Marathi as their mother tongue. <laughs> so he was like, but he's a Tamil. And, I, and he's also learning, I watch so much of Hindi on TV, and they speak Hindi also as well. But now, my brother-in-law's son, who lives with us all the time with these boys, I didn't know he can speak Marathi. So one day when we all were speaking Marathi, he was also like, uh, yes, Kaki, all this. And I was like, oh, you also speak Marathi now. My husband knows Marathi very well. Whenever I have these secret conversations with my mother on phone, he tells me, so when does your sister come? <laughs> I'm like, OK, uh, you know, it's no more a secret code or anything now. So and I was kind of <laughs> interested. <laughs> so all of us know all languages. But you know, I'm really intrigued by the fact that it's overwhelming sometimes. You know, to take language as a power device because my, my father-in-law sees it that these children should not be led away by their grandmother by learning Marathi, should not pick up those kind of cultural values, and my mother is kind of little, little tricky, and she says, no, no, you speak Marathi. Can so I now respond, <laughs> Rajiv, please? You see, I also present a data from my granddaughter. Her mother speaks Bengali. Her mother's parents speak Bengali. Her father's parents, which is us, we speak Maithili. And then there is Hindi, English, and Telugu in the Indians. We presented some data. On this campus where you are sitting just now, in my opinion, is the most multilingual community in the world. Any child here speaks at least six languages. You know, Tamil, Hindi, English by default. Then if the neighbor is Telugu, or if the neighbor is Malayali, or as in my case, you know, my immediate colleague was a Marathi mother's Tamilian father's daughter, both parents working. So the child grew up with a Maithili speaking aunt, neighbor. The child spoke Maithili, Hindi, English, Tamil, Marathi with equal proficiency. And today she is married and lives in Bombay. I can give you her email ID. Please don't tell her I gave it to you. <laughs> OK. Right. Next comment. Have more children. <laughs> and before it is late, please record them. We need all those data. Interested when you were saying so multilingual uh, settings, we need more data and research has to be done. Do please record <laughs> and have your copyright, but share it with Devki Rajesh and also me and Pratap, please. Thank you. I just want to share my observation about why people speak the way they do. I think human beings are very intelligent. We would like to expend the least effort to get something done. Right. Okay. So whether we imitate, I mean, we ought to achieve our communicative purpose. And when we say that somebody has a language disorder, uh, aren't we being too harsh by setting up certain things as norms and then treating every deviation from the norm as a disorder? Uh, I do think we're being a little harsh because uh, as we just discussed, people mix and switch languages with so much uh, felicity, with so much ease. Would you call that a language disorder or an intelligent way of communicating? Uh, this is all I want to say. Thanks a lot, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for your attention.